Okay. Can you turn me up? Kind of low. Good. All right, here we go. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to the NASA exhibit at AGU again. Um, my name is Steve Graham, and I'm going to be introducing the next three speakers as we are live streaming the next three Hyperwall talks. So the next three Hyperwall talks are out on YouTube and on NASA Science Live. So we're excited to introduce uh, Dr. Julie Robinson, uh, Deputy Director of NASA's Earth Science Division. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the NASA booth. And we are really excited to give you a little bit of a sense of why Earth system science observed from space has changed the way that we view our home planet, has prepared us for responding to climate change. And then I want to tell you a little bit about our upcoming launches and even give you a bit of an update about SWAT, our launch that is scheduled for tomorrow. So first of all, we operate at NASA the world's leading set of uh, leading suite of satellites in space. They are the most diverse. They make the most different kinds of measurements. They are the most in number. And they are giving us amazing insights into our planet. You can see how around the world every day the satellites are like just buzzing around the planet, giving us information. And to give you an example of how that really matters, I want to take the case of one of our observations, sea surface height. And what you see here in this swirl are the set of measurements of sea surface height that we have made in collaboration with our partners, both internationally and with NOAA as our partner, beginning with the Topex Poseidon mission in the early 90s, through the 2000s with Jason 1 and Jason 2. And down here at the bottom, you can see the SWAT mission that is getting ready to launch next week. Also, Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich and the future Sentinel-6B that our, our European partners will launch. What this means is that we have a record, a continuous record from the early 1990s to today that tells us how high the sea surface is. And that is so fundamental to understanding climate change and knowing what kinds of changes we may need to make to keep people safe and our communities safe as the climate changes and the seas change. So we also then, in Earth System Science, gain an understanding of the feedback loops, how the air and the water and the oceans and the land interact and lead to these kinds of synergistic effects that can be hard to predict. So this is an example of our measurements of carbon dioxide from the OCO3 OCO-2 mission and OCO-3 mission on the International Space Station is also making observations. And what you see in the orange are the carbon dioxide measurements. So they've been enhanced with color so you can see where they are. And as we look at in the fall, you can see that as we tip into winter, we have more and more carbon dioxide being produced in the northern climates where it gets cold and people are burning fossil fuels. And that cloud starts moving all around the globe as it um, is transferred by the major steering currents and the major winds. And that carbon dioxide serves as a blanket. It traps the heat, the radiation that comes in from the sun, and it holds it just like a blanket holds warmth when you're in your bed. It holds that, that uh, heat in, and that is what is causing the global temperature rise. So CO2 is a really important greenhouse gas. It is persistent in the atmosphere for between 50 and 200 years. And uh, it's one of the big greenhouse gases, we call it. Another greenhouse gas that we make measurements of is methane. Now, methane is interesting because it is not as persistent in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide is. It lasts about 12 years on average in the atmosphere, but it is far more potent in its ability to insulate. So it's about 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And so what that means when we see methane plumes, and you can see, for, for example, the industrial regions of China with really large methane emissions. You can see as the world rotates around, you'll see um, seasonal effects. You can see uh, regional effects. And the, but those methane plumes, they come from two major sources. There are two major ways that methane gets released in the atmosphere. One is fermentation of some kind, whether that is bogs um, decomposing things or cows and their ruminants and they produce methane in their guts, or burning, such as forest burning or fossil fuel burning, which is really just burning ancient, ancient plant material. 
And so one of the things that we're really interested in, and I'll show you a little bit later, is can we detect methane? Because those are point sources, those are specific things, and we might be able to intervene in those and actually have an impact in reducing climate change. So that's made methane a major focus around the world. Well, what does that heat look like? This is a great visualization, and it comes from um, our series data set. And this actually is the total heat that's trapped in the Earth's system over time. And you can see that record goes from 2000 to 2020. The little ups and downs, the pits and valleys in the yellow line are the seasons, where you see the winters and the summers. And then that red line is a 12-month running average. And you see that increase in energy, in heat, trapped in the Earth's system over time. What does that mean then when we go from heat to something we can see? One of the things we, oh, oh first I want to show you this. Uh, this is another way of looking at that temperature record. And this is the, the, the full temperature record, including ground observations, going back to the 1800s. When that circle, the line goes around the circle, you're seeing a year's worth of temperature on average around the world. And when it's near the green line, that means it's the same as the average. When it's inside that green line in a smaller circle, it means it's cooler than average. And we color it a little bit blue so it looks colder. And when it is outside the circle at the plus one or plus two, then we color it red or pink so that it looks a little bit warmer than average. And that represents years that are warmer than that overall mean total. And you can see as we get into the 90s, really as we got into the 80s and even the, the late 60s when I became part of this planet, um, we start getting more and more of the reds and pinks. There weren't a lot of reds and pinks early on in that time series. And another way to look at that is to turn that climate spiral on its side. And you can see that all of this, the years where the planet is much warmer than average, almost all of them are occurring in the most recent times. So it makes it, uh, really puts that in context, how much different the world is today than it was, say, for our grandparents. Well, what happens to all that heat? The heat goes into the oceans. The oceans are our perfect sink, both for heat and for carbon itself. And right now the oceans are, serve as a, as a sink for carbon and then the currents in the oceans move, uh, and, and for heat, and the currents in the oceans move that all around the planet. But we definitely have ocean basins where the heat accumulates. And I'll show you some charts of that in a minute because that really matters as we start talking about storms and weather that are generated from the oceans. And you see the ocean heat content in that little chart up on the left. It looks just like the previous chart that I showed you with the total, uh, uh, the total heating of the Earth. And so those things really match each other, which is why we know they're quite tightly connected. Well, one of the things that ocean heat does is it directly interacts with ice. And so this is um, ICE data. It's compiled from our Terra and Aqua MODIS instruments, as well as some of our collaborators' instruments around the world. This is the Arctic. And what you're seeing is the seasonal dwindling of the Arctic ice that happens each summer. And then it freezes back out. And so one of the measures that we can use to understand changes in the global climate is to look at that minimum ice extent. And in fact, the last 15 years are the minimum observed ice extent in the whole 43-year satellite record. So this tells us that we have made a dramatic change in Arctic ice, and that becomes a really important area for further study. So what happens when, what's going on in the ice when the water is warmer in the Arctic? Because I can tell you if you put your foot in that water, you would not call that warm water. But what actually happens is the warmer water can come up underneath the ice sheets and warm them up and start melting them. So you can't see it necessarily from above, but you're actually having significant erosion happen underneath. So this isn't something you could see easily if you flew over in an airplane but we actually have some amazing instruments that can measure the change in the mass of these ice sheets. So one of those sets of instruments we are GRACE, and now GRACE follow-on is operating. And it uses a technique called graf gravimetry to measure the mass of these land areas. 
And what you're seeing here is a time series over time as we move from 2002 to 2020. The areas that are coded red are areas where the mass has decreased. And the areas that are coded in blue are areas where the mass has increased. So that shows us places where there's a little bit of ice building up. And notice in Antarctica, there aren't a lot of those. In Greenland, there are none. And it shows us the places where ice is melting, where there's been a net loss of that ice. And so this is a pretty dramatic representation of how much Antarctica is changing, even though overall you might think, well, there's just a few changes along the edges. Well, rising sea levels means problems for humans because most humans actually live within 100 miles of a coastline. And those are areas where the combination of different things we experience, whether it's tidal flooding or storm-based flooding or uh, other kinds of storms and problems can really have impacts on people's lives. And you can see here, once again, the global mean sea level chart, along with some of the impacts that people experience. So how do we kind of understand the overall impact? Well, there's an easy rule of thumb. Wet places tend to get wetter, and dry places tend to get drier. And I want to talk a little bit about what that means. If you look at the graph or the, the chart in the upper left there, those red places in the ocean are the places that are extremely warm for that period of time. And, you know, I lived in Houston during Hurricane Harvey. In my backyard, I had a, uh, a rain gauge, and I got 55 inches of rain in two days. And uh, it was just extraordinary how much rain could come. And the reason that we had that kind of rain is because there was so much heat in the Gulf of Mexico and the thunderstorms just lined up and it was like a trail of rain that just kept feeding over us, band after band after band. That kind of process we're seeing Hurricanes, in this case, it was, it was a, only a Category 1 hurricane. It was not a super powerful hurricane, but it was able to just train those storms on and feed the energy from the ocean onto the land. And so that is the kind of challenge that we're facing as we look at the effects of heat in the oceans. Another challenge that we're seeing is rapid intensification. So the hurricanes that we saw this summer intensified much more rapidly than we used to observe uh, 20 years ago. And that rapid intensification is also driven by the energy stored in the oceans. Well, the other thing then that I said happens is dry places tend to get drier. And so in this case, you can see a soil moisture map from our SMAP satellite. And the blue areas are the places where the soils are moist, and the yellow areas are the places where the soils are drier. So you, as you expect, the Sahara Desert would be very dry, and the Sub-Saharan Africa, that's tropical Africa, would be very wet. And of course, we look then at the differences between what is normal and, and what happens later. You know, my grandfather was a farmer, and there are two things a farmer can control. They can decide what brand of seed, what, what genotype of seed to plant, and, and what species of seed to plant. And then they can decide when to plant it and how to till and, and kind of how to take care of it. But they can't control the weather. And my, my, I inherited from my grandfather his weather log of every single observation that he made on his farm because they live or die by that weather. And so as areas become drier that are areas that crops have traditionally been grown, it puts farmers at extraordinary risk if they don't understand and can't predict what's going on. And this is something that we're working on at NASA to help take the information we have and translate it into models and tools that help in predicting agriculture. So this is a, a set of decision-making tools that we developed that I think is really important. Um, on the top, you see wheel wheat yield projections over a pretty long period of time, going up 100 years, you know, up to, up to 2100. On the bottom left, you see maize or corn yield productions. So wh why are these so different? Because they look dramatically different. Well, on the wheat side, we see a lot of extra green shown in the temperate zone. Those are areas where you can grow winter wheat, um, you can grow summer wheat and winter wheat get two crops a year. There are a number of factors in the, in the models of what we predict the climate to be that make it more favorable for wheat. But if you look at, say, South America, you don't really see those same impacts happening because they have different climate zones and they're not going to have that same favorable conditions for wheat. If you compare that then to maize yield, maize is a crop that only grows in the summer and it needs a long, hot summer. But if that summer gets too hot, 
and the maize dries out too much, then the crop fails. And so some of these models are predicting really significant impacts on maize yields. Now, maize is part of green energy. It's part of ethanol production. It's part of a lot of things, but it's also part of our food system. And if you look at South America in this model, you'll see that there is no corresponding, you know, not only is there no more improvement in wheat growing, but there is a corresponding set of losses in maize production. And so these models, although they're fixed in a set of conditions, they help us start thinking about what do we need to do to our food system to make it more reliable, and what kinds of research should we do to come up with uh, better approaches to having a resilient food system that's resilient in the face of climate change. So Earth System Observatory is our next generation of satellites to teach us even more about the Earth as a system. It includes a set of four interconnected core missions, our surface biology and geology, surface deformation and change, clouds and aerosols, and mass change. And from what I've told you already, you could see how better measurements of these things would give us a better understanding of the Earth. We will also be selecting three additional measurements to take based on the best ideas that are out there in the scientific community, including things like greenhouse gases, ozone, atmospheric winds, currents, ecosystem structure, and snow depth. I want to share with you an extra observation, something really exciting, because I talked to you about how important methane was and how much methane could make a difference. EMIT is an instrument we just launched this summer in July on the International Space Station. And it was actually designed to help us measure global dust transfer, transfer of Saharan dust over North America. But it's an imaging spectrometer, and it's the best one we've ever flown in space. And so it can also detect methane plumes. And here you see a set of 10 methane plumes that, that were detected in Turkmenistan in August. And you can see those are very detailed point sources. You could look at the underlying imagery that we fused with this so we could understand what was going on on the surface. And we could see that these were coming from um, oil and gas production facilities and or possibly pipelines. So these become great ways somebody can go into the field and try to cap that methane and make a significant difference. And in fact, it was on the cover of Iran Times because one of these images of Iran that we published, they went and capped and started addressing a methane leak that they saw in that image. So it's really exciting. We are also uh, launching a constellation of, um, or our contribution to a constellation of air quality satellites called Tempo in the coming year. And tomorrow, of course, if all goes well, they are investigating a small anomaly right now in the rocket. But if all goes well, tomorrow morning, we will launch SWAT, which will make the best measurements ever of inland water, the whole water cycle, both inland and coastal water, at the highest resolution ever measured. And then we take these tools and we make them into things that help people understand their local community. So this is a sea level projection tool where people can click on a coastal community and uh, go right in and understand the impacts on a local community. Our Earth Action Strategy is focused on taking the observations that I showed you today and the tools and the science that I talked about and combining that with end user needs, with what people need to make good decisions for themselves and for their communities and for their countries. And we are designing a new Earth Information Center so that the kinds of information that I just showed you can be brought together and we can share stories with people that help them understand the Earth as NASA sees it. I really appreciate you coming today. I hope you are as excited about Earth Science as I am and really realize that there is so much we can do. We can identify how to mitigate climate change impacts. We can understand it better and we can improve our world. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't need that.
Okay, everybody. And now for something completely different. Uh, we're going to try something new. So I, I'm, I've done Hyperwall Talks a lot. I've never done one live. So hi, Mom, and uh, hi, Linda. Um, and also, I've never done a demo live. So let's keep our fingers crossed that the Wi-Fi uh, works for me. I do have some things loaded. But what I want to do today is talk about how you can look at the sun. So how you can have an eye on the sun. Now, of course, we've all heard you don't want to go outside and look at the sun without the right kind of protective gear. Uh, but you can go out even with your eclipse glasses, and you can look up in the sky, and you can look at the sun with those. But if we put telescopes into space, we get a whole new view. So one of the spacecraft, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, has given us spectacular views in 10 different wavelengths. So what I'm going to do is show you some of the many tools that you can use to look at the sun and make your own videos, your own images, and look at the sun in near real-time data. So I'll show you a couple of websites, and then I'm going to try to do a demo, uh, and hopefully you'll get to see some of these tools in action. So first place, SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, has its own website. Now I've put Q QR codes for everything. This is um, easy to find. You can Google it, and there you can go look at the current images, They've got browsers. They've even got a little um, dashboard tool. You can, you can get access to the, to the raw data. Um, another place to go to, this was created by a colleague of mine in, in uh, Ireland, uh, and he was working in the U.S. when he first started this. It's called Solar Monitor. So there you can go. You can look at the images, but you also get some context about what's happening on the sun. Are there solar flares? What kind of sunspots are on there? And they're labeled. And it gives you real-time information, and you can also go back in time and see what happened in the past. If you really want to get into the nitty-gritty, you know how to use Python, for example, you can get the raw data, and you can use it with this package called SunPy to analyze the data, to look at images, to look at time series, all kinds of cool stuff. But now there are a couple of really nice tools that allow you to look at the sun right now, manipulate the image data, find out what's going on. The first of them is called Helio Viewer, which I will show you this, which is a website. This is what you see when you first go to Helio Viewer the very first time. Of course, sans the, uh, the QR code. And then the other one I'm going to show you is an offshoot of Helio Viewer, which is a desktop application called JHelio Viewer, J for Java. And this is something you can download for Windows, for Mac, and for Linux. Um, and it gives you similar kinds of tools, but there are some things you can do differently. So they both have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, and I use them both on a daily basis to look at what's happening on the sun. So let's, let's take a quick flip to, um, to Helio Viewer. So let me go to a browser, a web browser. Okay, so again... This is what you see when you first go to Helio Viewer. Uh, HelioViewer.org is the website. So you can see there's an image, recent image of the sun. If you click over here, this shows you all types of things to get different data. So you see the time of the data that you're looking at. You can move around and pick the, the, the time scale that you want to move around. Like you can move forward if there's data ahead by hours, minutes, days, weeks. Um, and then you can also go in and change the type of data that you want to look at. Uh, so let me zoom in. You can zoom in. So now we've, hopefully I'm not tasking the Internet too much here. Let me zoom out one. Okay, so now we're, we've zoomed in. It's going to take a second here. But one of the cool things is you can see that it allows you to overlay, for example, the Earth for scale. So you can see how big the Earth is in relation to what you're looking at on the sun. You guys tell me when I got like five minutes left, okay? Um, and you can change that. Let's see. It's well, the internet's not going to work for me, so it's not going to not going to happen. But you can go in. You can change the instrument or the spacecraft. So there's STO, but there's also SOHO, Stereo. Yoko, a whole bunch of ones to allow you to look at different images. And I can go in and say, all right, I'm going to add a layer. So I'm going to put Soho Lasco on here. So let's see if this works. 
If I can zoom out. And, of course, it's, it's not doing it. So, um, all right. Well, we're going to do this with Jay Healy of yours because the, uh, the, the, the Wi-Fi is, is not cooperating with me here. But anyway, what I'll tell you is I added another layer. And what that layer is is I added what's called a coronagraph. It's kind of an artificial eclipse around the sun. And if I zoomed out, you would now see this artificial eclipse. What I could do on this website is I can add different layers with different wavelengths and melt them together. Look at different wavelengths. I can change the opacity. Um, I can zoom in on specific areas. I can make a video. I can make screenshots. Um, you can actually make a video and send it directly to YouTube if you want. Um, and then I have all kinds of options, and I'll show you right here, all kinds of things that I can add. Like I can click on here and put the location of sunspots from NOAA. I can put on here the location of recent solar flares. So there's all kinds of stuff I can add to it. Now what I'm going to do now is go to JHelio Viewer because I've downloaded the data. So hopefully that, that will uh, work a little better this time. Now what's exciting is I downloaded the new data this morning because we've now had some solar activity. We've had a whole bunch of solar flares today. In fact, I think last time I checked, we've had 10 what are called M-class flares, medium-sized flares. Um, the biggest one was an M6, which is pretty big. And I'm going to show you the flares. So I'll start off. I've preloaded a bunch of different layers. So I'm going to pick the best wavelength to look at flares with STO. It's called 131. doesn't necessarily mean a lot, but what that is is that's Extreme ultraviolet light is showing us super hot plasma, okay? The flares are making plasma 20 million degrees or hotter on the sun when they happen. So we pick that. There's the image. So I'm now going to play. I've loaded several hours on here. And what I want to point your, your attention to is look in this area down here, that bright patch. You're going to see some flashes. You're going to see some solar flares. So let's, let's get this going. All right. Oh, there's one. Up, oh, there's another couple of ones. Up, oh, there's the biggie. Okay. So what you're seeing is real near real time, you're seeing these solar flares. Okay. So what do I want to do now? I want to add another layer. So let's add um, slightly cooler plasma. But what this is, what this particular wavelength, 171, does is it allows you to see loops that are coming out of the sunspot. These loops are where these flares are originating from. Uh, and what I can do here is I can actually change the order of the layers. And then I can go in and I can actually change the opacity, for example. Let me switch them back again. So I can change the opacity. You can see I'm, I'm blending them in together. Sometimes I can go in, what if I want to take some of the color out in a different color and see different structure? And I'm going to put another wavelength. I'm now going to put what's called 193. So let me show you what that wavelength looks like. So this is another wavelength called 193. This shows you about 2 million degrees. And this wavelength is cool because you can see areas called coronal holes, for example. And you still see the areas where the flares come from. And so if I play that, you can now see what happens when you get a solar flare in a different wavelength. See how it looks. You still see there's the flash. And now I'm going to overlay this one on top of it. And I'm going to change the opac I'm going to change the blending a little bit. Let's see this way so you can kind of mix them together okay so you can go in and add lots of different wavelengths together you can play around you can take particular colors you know it's it's got rgb you can take some of the colors out that accentuates other things um but now you saw that i had added in the previous one soho so let's see did i add soho here no maybe i didn't um well, in the meantime, what I'm going to do, it may not work, but it's not going to stop me from doing what I'm already doing. If I go in here, so I can click Add New Layer, can go in to look at, now here's SOHO, which has, this is Solar Heliospheric Observatory. 
it has the coronagraph data. So I'm going to click that, and you can see it's loading, okay? And it will, you can see it's actually loading pretty quickly. All right, Internet's going. So let's, uh, let's pause this, and then let's zoom out. Okay, now I've added this additional layer, which is the coronagraph from Soho, one of the two coronagraphs. And so now we see the outer part this creates kind of an artificial eclipse, not as good as what we get here on the ground because you see that it doesn't quite go as close. But I can see things coming out of the sun. So when there are huge eruptions, I can see them. Sometimes I'll see comets coming in. I can see planets coming in and out of view. Um, and so you can keep adding different layers. I could add another one, but let me play this. So now, oh, look at that. So one of the questions was, did that flare produce a coronal mass ejection, a blast of material? Well, looky here. Let's watch. Bam. You see that stuff coming out, that puff of smoke? That's a coronal mass ejection, and that's how I found out. I couldn't see it very well looking at the disk, but when I look outer part of the corona away from the sun, I can now see it. And that's what a real-time observer would do to figure out if something happens, if something actually blasted off the sun. And you can do this yourself. You can monitor space weather on a daily basis. You can then take this. You can make a video. You can make an MP4 with this. Makes it pretty quickly. It's very efficient, so the size is not too big. I can go in and do all kinds of things to annotate this. So let me uh, let me show you some of what I can do. So I could go in and add a grid to the sun if I zoom in some. How are we doing on time? Keep going? All right, all right. Groovy. Uh, I could put a little mini view up here to see what's the full field of view. Uh, let's see what else can I do. Oh, you know, we have something called the PFSS. doesn't mean a whole lot, but what it is, it's a model of the sun's magnetic field. And if I click on that and zoom in, I'm going to pause it, and I'm going to zoom in some. And look at all that squiggly stuff coming out. That's magnetic field. So that's a computer model that's now taken the magnetic field data that I have on the sun, and it generates what we can't normally measure. It generates a computer model of that. So now I can see the magnetic field coming out of all those sunspots. Um, and what does that magnetic field actually look like? Well, let's, let's turn off some of these. Let me scroll back up. I'm going to take all this goody, and I'm actually going to look at the magnetic field that generates it. So this, these areas where you see the, the red and yellow and the blue and green, those are magnetic fields measured on the surface, the visible surface of the sun, what we call the photosphere. And the color tells you which way the magnetic field is going. Is it going out of the sun or into the sun or like towards you and away from you? So the red is going in and the blue is going out, okay? And you can see where the model is kind of connecting some of it. Now, what I can do, you, it, you don't see all of them because I haven't added a lot of points to it because it starts to get kind of busy. But you could go in and you can adjust that. You can see more structure if you want. And then I can go in and watch it move. Uh, I'm going to turn this off because it gets a little bit messy. Uh, let's see. Okay, so you can do, let me show you a couple other things you can do. Um, one of the things you can do, if I go back to looking at the corona, okay, I'm going to take the magnetic field data off. I'm looking at the corona, I'm going to add back some color. Uh, I can accentuate the outer corona. Let me move in a little bit. Okay. So you see I turned the, uh, the, I can increase the contrast on the edge there. 
But what if I just wanted to look at the sun and not the stuff extended? Well, I can turn that outer part off, okay, so I can see that. I'm going to turn off this grid because it's getting a little bit busy here. I don't really need this mini view. Um, but another thing I can do is while I'm sitting here, I'm going to add one more data set. I'm going to add sunspots, okay? These are, this is what's called continuum. Well, maybe I will, maybe I won't. Okay, it's loading. So what are the things that you could do if you loaded sunspot data? So as soon as that's loaded, what I'm going to show you is I can track a sunspot, okay? And I can follow how it moves. Because one of the things that's crazy about the sun is because it's not a solid body, the sun moves faster in the middle when it rotates than it does when you move to the poles. You can actually use a computer model to follow that. So I'm going to turn off the coronal data. Okay, so now... We're looking at the sunspots. There's a bunch of sunspots on the sun. And if I wanted to watch a sunspot evolve, but I don't want it to go off the screen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in to a sunspot I want to look at. And I'm going to drag it up here. And I want it to sit there in the middle of the screen. Now, if I just play the movie, it's going to move like this, okay? But I, I want it to stay there. I want to watch it move, watch it change. So I'm going to zoom in, and then I'm going to turn on tracking. So now it's tracking the sunspot, so the sunspot's not actually moving. Now another thing I can do, and let's see if this works, I can actually show because the sun is, well, it won't, there we go. Because the sun is, again, moving differentially, what if I try to follow that? Uh, okay, that's not going to work. Internet's not working for me here. Okay, but you can see there's all kinds of things you can do. Now, I've got a bunch of different types of, a bunch of different wavelengths. I've got this one, this one, and this one. I'm going to zoom back out. But I like to look at them all individually. So I can just go up here and do multi-view, and bang. Now I've got all of them together. And I can actually watch them all move and all rotate. Let me turn off this differential rotation. There we go. So I can watch them all move separately, or I can lay them over on top of each other to see what's happening. Okay. So you've got all kinds of things you can do and explore. Um, you, can, you can rotate images. Let me turn off this multi-view, and I will turn off other ones. Well, it's not going to, it's not cooperating. But if it was cooperating, I could rotate the image. I can actually move around the sun. Uh, I can change the angle. I can do all kinds of things to it. So it's got a lot of flexibility, and then I, I won't do it now because it's not going to happen fast with the Internet. But, again, just like with Helio Viewer, I can go in and I can select all these different things that have been detected. Like I can get it to label the sunspots by clicking this. I can get it to label where has there been a solar flare. And I can go through and click each one of them. It will label it on the screen, and then I've got all of this annotation to tell me what's happening. So it's a great tool. You can do an awful lot with it. You can even go up and select to get back to the original data. So if you really want to get into the nitty-gritty, you maybe you know a little Python, you can go back and use that other tool, SunPy, to allow you to manipulate the data yourself. But this is a great tool and something that even, you know, just as a scientist, you need a quick browse. You want to look at the data very quickly because the data is quite big. This gives you a lot of flexibility to what you can do. So... I hope that uh, everyone get a chance to play with it. I'm going to switch back to the, uh, let's see, hold on here. Whoops. I'm going to switch back to this and go to the last one. So here are all the different packages that I showed you. So you can take a picture with a QR code if you want. Um, I'll leave this up for a second, and then I'm going to switch over to uh, the last slide. We're doing okay? All right. We're good. Um, 
And the last slide, just for a little advertisement, folks would like me to advertise the Heliophysics Big Year. So this is something that uh, NASA is um, uh, working on. This is going to be an opportunity to connect with what's happening in heliophysics. This is going to start in 2023 with the annular solar eclipse. It will extend to the end of 2024 when Parker Solar Probe makes its closest approach to the sun. And this will also cover the uh, total solar eclipse in April 2024 with lots of activities of citizen science, education, all sorts of uh, engagement activities. So I would encourage everyone to take a look at that, check it out. Um, and at that, I'm going to see if anyone's got any questions about any of these particular tools or even questions about the sun and solar physics. I'm quite happy to answer any of that. And uh, in order to do that, I will switch back to my little tool here. I'm going to stop there. Let me take this off. There we go. Whoops. Okay. So, all right. Any uh, any questions from anybody? Uh, anything you're interested in? Yes, sir. Oh, so the question is, is J Helio Viewer compatible only with the Mac? Or Actually, J Helio Viewer works on Mac, okay, OS X. It works on Linux, and it works on Windows. So all three. They also put out fairly regular updates. You can even get the betas if you want, and they're very responsive. If, if they're features that you want or things aren't quite working, you know, the, the, the coding team will, will respond pretty well about that. So, yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Questions about the sun, heliophysics? No? All right. Well, if you're interested in looking at the sun, if you're interested in space weather, I would highly encourage you to check out these tools. They're a lot of fun. There's an awful lot of cool things going on. We are getting close to solar maximum. Okay, The sun has an 11-year cycle from low to high activity back down to low. We're a couple of years away and we're going to be reaching solar maximum. We're already starting to see some of that. So solar activity is going to start kicking up. And it's not just happening at the sun. All the stuff that the sun is doing is traveling through the solar system. It's impacting the Earth. It's impacting the other planets. It's impacting the things we put into space. So it's going to continue to get really exciting. So it's not just about the sun. It's about the sun and its influence on everything in the solar system.